This is the introductory video for applying Gauss's law to find electric fields. There will be many videos to follow of specific examples that you will be responsible for this course, but this is just the general overview. So Gauss's law is one of the fundamental laws of electromagnetic theory, and in all its glory, it looks like this. E dot dA Q in over epsilon naught. I think your textbook uses Q enclosed. I use Q in. Now, the left-hand side of this, you will never have to do this integral. The reason that you'll never have to do it for this course is because we are only going to look at highly symmetric charge distributions where this integral becomes extremely simple. The right-hand side, it's either going to be a simple calculation of how much charge we're dealing with inside what's called our Gaussian surface, or you may have to integrate to get the right-hand side. Now, the reason that we don't have to integrate the left-hand side is, first of all, notice this is a dot product. So the electric field dotted with an area vector. If the electric field is everywhere parallel to the area vector, that dot product disappears. If the electric field is constant everywhere on the area, the electric field comes out of the integral. Okay, so this symbol, this double integral with a circle, this means a closed surface integral. Which means we must be dealing always with a closed surface, and that closed surface we call the Gaussian surface. It is purely a mathematical tool that allows us to calculate electric fields. There are no surfaces. It's just like if you think about the Earth going around the sun and someone draws a picture, they'll draw the sun and then they'll draw this line like this of the Earth going around the sun. There is no line. That's purely a mathematical tool that allows us to do calculations of the trajectory of the Earth around the sun. Okay, so it's a similar kind of thing. This Gaussian surface is just a mathematical abstract tool. Okay, so in this very, very special case, that integral just becomes electric field times area equals Q in over epsilon naught. So when you solve that for the electric field to get Q in over A epsilon naught, that is what I call the working form of Gauss's law. It's a very simple equation. It was very powerful for calculating electric fields. You will not find that equation on a formula sheet because that's a very specific application of Gauss's law. Okay, so how are we going to use it? So we're going to use it to find electric fields of anything spherically um, charged distribution. So it could be, could be a point charge, but that's pretty simple. It could be a big ball of charge, whether the charge is uniformly distributed in there or not. It could be a hollow sphere of charge. So this is, that's not a ring, that's supposed to be a hollow, uh, like a Christmas tree ball. Um, or we're going to do infinitely long rods or cylindrical distribution. So this has to go off to infinity. And the reason for that is that we need the electric field to be no end effects, nice and symmetric. This would go out kind of like porcupine, like this would be coming out here as well. This is 3D. It's kind of hard to, to draw, but the electric field would be coming everywhere radially out from that rod. We could have a cylinder that's a big fat cylinder, once again infinitely long, so that the electric field here outside is also always no end effects, no curvy effects at the end. Okay. So step one is to draw the picture. So let's say, as an example, we want to find the field due to a point charge. Now we already know how, we already know the answer to this, but let's use Gauss's law to find it. So find field due to point charge Q, a distance R from the charge. You have to be told where it is you want the field, because obviously it's different everywhere. Okay, so step one is to draw a picture. So you draw a picture of the Q. That's obviously spherically symmetric. 
you draw a point out here, a distance r away, and then you say want field here. It's very important you identify where you want the field because that's going to be crucial in your experiments, in your calculations. Okay, step two is to choose and draw a Gaussian surface. So you have two choices. It's either a sphere or it's a cylinder. And the way you decide is if it's a spherical charge distribution, you use a sphere. If it's a, a infinitely long rod or a sheet or a hollow cylinder or something, you use a cylinder. Okay, so in this case, it's going to be a sphere. And so I'm going to draw my Gaussian surface in red. The Gaussian surface must go through the point where you want the field. Okay, so this red thing is a spherical Gaussian surface. It's just a tool. It's an abstract mathematical thing that we draw that helps us do this calculation. Okay, and the radius of this Gaussian surface is the same as the radius of the distance from Q to where we want the field. The Gaussian surface must go through the point where you want the field. So Gaussian surface must pass through the point where you want the field. Always. Field. Okay, so that's step two, the Gaussian surface. Go back to our pen here. Oh, black. There we go. Okay, that's step three. Step three is to figure out how much charge is inside this sphere. Well, you just look at the sphere, and obviously the, all the charge that's inside is Q. So Q is equal to Q in, which is the charge inside the sphere. Now that seems pretty basic and simple here, but there are cases where we may be drawing Gaussian surfaces inside of giant balls of charge, in which case it's a different amount of charge inside our Gaussian surface, not necessarily all the charge. Okay, next we need to calculate the area of the Gaussian surface. Well, the area of a sphere, surface area of a sphere, is 4 pi r squared. It will always be that the area of your Gaussian surface. That's it. Now we go ahead and put the values into our formula. So the Gauss's working form of Gauss's law, Q in over A epsilon naught. Q in is everything inside Q. Area is 4 pi r squared epsilon naught. And sure enough, there it is, kq over r squared, which we already knew that that's the electric field due to a point charge. That is only the magnitude. So as far as direction goes, you have to work that out yourself. Okay, so let's quickly do one where we're going to use a cylinder. So if we were using um, find E due to infinitely long rod of charge density lambda. Now, remember we did the electric field due to a charged rod previously, but that was a finite length charge rod. That's completely different than this infinitely long rod. So to show it's infinitely long, I'll do that little infinity symbol here. And then we'll go down and do it at the other end as well. Okay. And obviously you can't tell, you can't say what its total charge is because it's infinitely long, so it has an infinite amount of charge. But you can be told the charge density, and this is equal to the charge per unit length. Okay. So step one, there's our charge configuration. Um, and then you have to say where you want the field. So find electric field, a dis we'll do the same, a distance r from center. Okay, so we'll go out here, distance r, and we want the field here. Want e here. Now, because this is a long cylinder, obviously we're going to choose a Gaussian surface that's cylindrical. So we put a red pen here. Now, the Gaussian, you can have any length you like for this Gaussian surface, but it, the edge of it must pass through that point. So we just do this abstract mathematical surface around this rod, and I'll just make it any old length I want. I'll just call it L. But its radius is definitely R because it has to go through the point where we want the field. Okay, now 
this rod keeps going. Remember, this is just an abstract tool. It, it can magically just pass right through that rod without any trouble. Okay, so next, Q in. So how much charge is inside that cylinder? Now this cylinder has chopped this rod so that it doesn't contain all the charge. It only contains this amount of charge from here to here. This bit. That's Q in. And that Q in will be the linear charge density times the length of my Gaussian surface. Okay, so charge per length times length, that's how much charge is inside that red cylinder. The area, the surface area, this is the area through which the electric field is piercing. This is just the sides of the cylinder. The, the electric field is not piercing through the top or the bottom. So we just choose the curvy sides. So the surface area of a cylinder is 2 pi r l. 2 pi r circumference times l length. Okay, so this is only the area through which E is parallel, vector E is parallel to dA. Remember that integral that we started with and I said the dot product just becomes E times dA if they're parallel, so I'm stuck with that. I'm limited to that because of the working form that I have for Gauss's Law. Alrighty, now that's it. We put it into the formula. Q in over A epsilon naught, and we get lambda times L over 2 pi R L epsilon naught. Notice how the L for the Gaussian surface cancels out. Does not matter what the length of the Gaussian surface is. Anybody could have chosen any length you wanted. So the electric field due to an infinitely long rod is lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught r. Sometimes we write this as 2k lambda over r, because remember k is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Okay, so those are the basic examples. You'll have lots more videos of, of more complex examples.